large language models. Is it all hype? Where do you see them playing into your workflow and how like you actually get work done? Yeah, so we we full on use them. Uh, we we train them, we deploy them, and uh, they're pretty pretty incredible. I don't know. So I, I think I think we're kind of going through I don't know an inflection point or something like that, uh, where lots and lots of applications of natural language processing, which might have been uh, you know you might have had different bespoke solutions for different tasks, let's say question answering or text classification or things like that. These can kind of all be solved by large language models and possibly by the exact same large language model. And so we, it's kind of a, a constant question on our team, how much, how many different, let's say, use cases of a model do we want to fit into a single oh, model? Yeah, nice. Um, you know, there's, there's benefits there, uh, but then like, this is the MLOps podcast, right? Like there's like operationally, it's maybe easier to have one model, but then, and maybe we'll talk about this later. Like if you want to start automatically retraining this model and you have multiple tasks, then it makes life a lot more difficult. Um, but it's, it's a very fun area right now. And I, I feel like there's, you know, it's, it, it's unclear exactly how much we can, we can shove into single models and, and be successful with, but yeah. That, that's interesting. Just to clarify, I, D made it sound like I, I wrote something that said it's all hype, and that's not the. It's just that <laughs> it just I was the, throwing you under the bus. Misworded in some way. That's not at all what I was saying. But um, uh, yeah, that, that's that's fascinating. I I think so. One thing you know, playing around with like GPT three that I've noticed, and I've I've been you know messing around with it to generate prompts for Dolly and stuff like that. Just as like a side thing, but uh, you know, it gets things totally wrong pretty frequently and so this whole notion of prompt engineering is uh, really uh uh i, I believe it's going to be like a, a very huge thing and it's kind of just you know something that we, we it's just so new that we don't talk about it too much but uh the my my realization is that like it's pretty easy to have just like totally wacky like outputs from these large language models and from a product manager perspective that makes me think about like what use cases is something like this at the current stage of this technology applicable to? And uh, I think the types of use cases are ones where mistakes are not really high uh, cost. And so I wonder if that's something that you, your team has been thinking about, like when we're figuring out where we can apply this stuff, let's focus on the ones where if we get it wrong, it's not that big of a deal uh, as opposed to like, I, I don't know, something where, you know, it's some fraud thing or whatever, it costs us a million dollars. Is that the kind of conversations you're having internally? Like, how are you, how are you taking this new technology and then figuring out internally, like, how do we apply it? What are the big questions you're uh, figuring out? Yeah, yeah. So that's, those are great points. We, you know, we can put guardrails in place, right? So, uh, you know, like right now we, we suggest a, a response. So a string of text that we think that the, you know, that, the merchant can send back to their customer. Uh, and we have a bunch of filters after that point in order to make sure that we're not showing suggestions that are obviously dangerous or bad. So for example, we don't want to leak PII into the suggestions that we're generating. And so we have detectors for that and we make sure to suppress any any text that might contain PII and things like that. You know, uh, Models are trained off of biased data, and so we don't want to, you know, start manifesting that, that those biases as well. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, this isn't this isn't perfect. And I think one big question for us in the team is how do we want to deal with the human that is in the loop of of our system? So I mentioned that we have a chatbot. That chatbot is basically fully automated. If the chatbot can't handle something, then it alerts the business owner to have them, you know, mm. swoop in. But for, you know, if we are just suggesting a response to say, it's kind of okay if it's not great, right? You know, nobody's gonna lose lots of money. Like I, I used to work in recommendation systems and you know, I, I worked for like a like a beauty products company. And I was like, all right, like if you get suggested the wrong lipstick, you, like you're going to be okay. Um, but yeah. then as you mentioned for fraud use cases, uh, you it's, it's much more important. And so I think that how much you rely on the human in the loop uh, is a way to kind of navigate how much you are willing to allow the, for like basically how conservative you have to be with your models. The, and these are the, just to bring it back to the thing we were saying before, 
this kind of understanding of the cost of a false positive or something like that is something that is very important for the product manager to be able to think through with a really deep intuition. And so um, it's one of the things we're always evaluating, like, do you get it really? Because it's a whole new domain of uh, dimension of like, of, of product understanding and technology understanding that you have to have that really affects the, it's a, a primary factor in the end product experience. And, um, and so like how, I think like how the product teams and like your team work together is, is kind of like this new thing. And, uh, sounds like you guys are figuring it out, but a lot of people are, are still just they're like so like we don't even have a product manager who knows anything about this but they're taking it they're taking ethan's course right now <laughs> something like that <laughs> what what uh what advice would you have for other folks in their uh kind of like i'm an ml engineer and i got a product manager who doesn't like who's not an expert at this stuff how can i work really effectively with that person yeah i i think one key piece is you know, stepping out of your narrow domain and trying to explain things in in the context of, let's say, non-technical stakeholders. And so, you know, one piece is defining your metrics in terms of business metrics as opposed to model metrics. You know, I most like 99.9% .9 of the people in the world don't know what the area under an ROC curve is, you know, and so like you just shouldn't even be telling somebody that. 